what is perhaps so moving about Henry Nowen's book the, uh, on the prodigal son is that he's so open uh, and honest about himself and his own struggles. He writes that for a long time in his life he struggled with self-rejection. He says it was a, a fierce battle that raged within, making him feel and think that uh, he was worthless, uh, useless, negligible. He goes on to say that for a long time he considered low self-esteem to be some kind of virtue. He says he was warned so often against pride and conceit that he came to consider it a good thing to look down on himself. But in writing in his later years, he writes how he had come to see that the real sin is to deny God's first love for me, to ignore my original goodness. He says that without claiming God's infinite love and our, our original goodness, we lose touch with our true selves. And we begin to embark on a destructive search for that which can only be found in the divine. For some, that destructive search leads them to a distant country of destructive and wild living like the younger son. For others, it is expressed in the attempt to justify one's existence to prove one's worthiness and to earn others' love through hard work, dutifulness and achievements. But by contrast, Henry Nowen writes that the parable of the prodigal son is a story that speaks of a love that existed before any rejection was possible and will still be there after all rejections have taken place. It is the first and everlasting love of God, who is the fountain of all true human love. He says that Jesus' whole life and ministry really had only one aim, to reveal this inexhaustible and unlimited love of God. And this is perhaps expressed nowhere more profoundly than in the parable of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son, which Henry Nowen suggests could be more accurately entitled the parable of a father's love, or more specifically, a parable of God's love, a love that comes out to meet us, welcomes us home, and celebrates our arrival. Today I wish to explore that infinite love of the Father in the parable as we look more closely at this parable of Jesus, as well as the parable, uh, as exploring Rembrandt's painting of the return uh, of the prodigal son. Rembrandt's portrayal of the father, Henry Nowen notes, um, that, that Rembrandt paints the father as almost blind. He does not see with his physical eyes. Rather, in Rembrandt's portrayal, it seems that he sees with an inner vision that goes beyond just the physical side. He sees with inner spiritual eyes, with an inner seeing of the heart that goes beyond mere outward appearances. As Henry Nowen suggests, it's a seeing that encompasses the whole of humanity. Even the elder son in the painting has light shining on him. Despite the fact that he has chosen to stand in the shadows, he too is touched by the gentle inner light of the Father. Henry Nowen points out that the, the true centre of the painting are the Father's hands. And those hands appear to have become extensions of his inner seeing, extensions of this inner perception of the heart. The hands of the Father appear to be the instruments by which the Father expresses and communicates his love as they are stretched out in blessing. Of particular interest in the painting is that the two hands are different. The one hand seems strong, muscular and masculine, holding the son's shoulder. The other hand appears slender and soft, resting gently on the younger son's back. Henry Nowen makes the interesting observation that this hand is the hand of a mother. And so in a single painting, Rembrandt reveals that God is the source of both fatherly and motherly love. God is not just the source of masculine strength, but also the source of 
feminine gentleness. It reminds us of the feminine love of God expressed by the prophet Isaiah. Can a mother forget the child at her breast? I will never forget you. Henry Nowen draws attention to the great red robe of the Father, which is stretched out like a tent, ready to create a warm, a safe space for the weary traveller who has come home. He suggests that the cloak again speaks of this warm, feminine love of God, like a mother hen who is taking her chicks under her wings, a reminder of that passage later on in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, and he cries out, How long I, I, how I have longed! to gather you under my wings, but you refused. Writing of Rembrandt's portrayal of the Father in the parable, Henry Nowen writes that seldom, if ever, has God's immense compassionate love been expressed in such a poignant way. Every detail of the Father's figure, his facial expression, his posture, the colours of his dress, and, most of all, the still gesture of his hands, speaks of that divine love for humanity that existed from the beginning and ever will be. Turning to the parable itself, what does the parable tell us of the Father and, by implication, of God? Firstly, the love of the Father at the beginning of the parable is a love that does not constrain or imprison his younger son. His is a love that lets the younger son go. His love is too great to force the son to stay. It's a love that makes room for people to make mistakes. It's a love that is wise enough to recognize that sometimes people need to face the consequences of their own actions before they will come to their senses. It's therefore a love that holds dear, and yet a love that is willing to let go, even though it might break his own heart in doing so. As Henry Nowen expresses it as, as a father, he wants his children to be free, free to love. And that freedom includes the possibility of leaving home, going to a distant country, and losing everything. Secondly, we see that the love of the Father is such that he has clearly been waiting for his son's return. He's been on the lookout, having let his son go, knowing that he was about to make some terrible mistakes. He doesn't wash his hands of his son. He does not disown the wayward boy. He continues to hold him close to his heart with a deep longing within him that causes him to watch and to wait longingly. For the son's return. Thirdly, when the younger son returns, the father runs out to meet him. And Timothy Keller writes that no respectable patriarch in the ancient world would have gone running out to meet a wayward son. He would have considered it beneath his dignity. It's far more likely in the ancient world that the patriarchal father would have emphasized his authority, making the son wait, giving him the cold shoulder to emphasize the crimes of the son committed against him. Perhaps even more likely that he might have had his son publicly flogged, even before willing to meet with him. Not so with the father in Jesus' parable. He runs. He runs out to meet his lost son who has returned home. He wears his heart on his sleeve. There is something reckless and undignified about the love of this father, which is why Timothy Keller refers to the parable not as the parable of the prodigal son, but rather of the prodigal father. Fourthly, there is no, no desire to punish. The lost son has already been punished enough by his own waywardness. He has already experienced the hell of his own making. The father's only desire is to, is to heal and to bless. Fifthly, the father's love in the parable is extravagant. He's not into half measures with his love, as he says to his servants that they should go and put a ring on his son's finger and to put the best robe on him. 
The father in the parable wants only the best for his son, which suggests that God only wishes the very best for us as well. Sixthly, this is a father who enjoys a celebration. Isn't it interesting that in a different era where Christian groups um, often look down on dancing, and in fact, I, I wonder if, if there are probably some groups like that around still today. Dancing is the work of the devil. Uh, I wonder how they justified such a stance when at this high point of the parable of Jesus, the father throws a party celebrating the return of his son, and we read that there is music and dancing. Henry Nowen writes that uh, he is not used to the image of God throwing a big party. It seems to contradict the seriousness and solemnity which he always attached to God. And yet Henry Nowen reminds us that so many of Jesus' parables are about feasts and banquets, a reminder that the invitation into the spiritual life is supposed to be an invitation into joy. God rejoices, writes Henry Nowen, not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children who was lost has been found. What I'm called to, says Henry Nowen, is to enter that joy. It is God's joy. Not the joy that the world offers. It's the joy of being embraced and being held by a love that transcends and is stronger than death. Perhaps one could call it a crucified and a risen joy. And then lastly, as, as I said last week, the, the same father who runs out to meet the younger son is the same father who leaves the celebration to plead with his elder son to come in and join them. God does not play favourites. Henry Nowen writes, there is no doubt that his heart goes out to both of his sons. He loves them both. He hopes, he hopes to see them together as siblings around the same table. He wants them to experience that, different as they are, they belong to the same household and are children of the same father. And so here, says Henry Nowen, is the God that I want to believe in, a father, perhaps a mother one could say, who from the beginning of creation has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing never forcing himself on anyone, but always waiting, never letting his arms drop down in despair, but always hoping that his children will return. He has no desire to punish them. They have already been punished excessively by their own inner and outer waywardness. Instead, his deepest desire is to say more with his hands than his mouth, You are my beloved. On you, my favour rests. Amen.